I got this boat anchor of a, of a mic uh, box here on my pocket and it fell, fell off this morning. Good morning. Good to have you out with us this morning. i telling the brother uh, uh, Bruce, that is your name, isn't it? Yeah, Bruce, uh, uh, that uh, we might have a skeleton crew today. And uh, we were talking about that there should be plenty of food because everybody else thought there was going to be a skeleton crew, so they all brought a little extra like. So if you're here this morning, you are welcome to come and stay after the services this morning for our uh, carry-in. That don't, doesn't make any difference whether you brought anything or not, okay? All right, just a quick look at our announcements this morning. Today is family day. That means we will be following our service this morning with... Uh, uh, with a dinner here in back in the, what we call the barn. Sunday, April the 4th is DVD in the 10 o'clock service, and then Sunday through Wednesday evening is Brother Andy Tully. Good preaching. We're going to enjoy him, so I hope that if you've never had an opportunity to hear Brother Andy, uh, come out and be with us that, uh, that week, all right? Sunday, April the 18th through the 21st. Workday is April 24th, 9 o'clock in the morning. Family Day is April the 25th, and then we have coming up July the 11th through the 15th is Vacation Bible School, so I hope that you will remember that. All right, uh, Brother Bruce is going to come now. We're going to have some music, okay? Song number 42, I believe, is what he has selected. Let's stand together if you're able. 42. Can you handle 42? <laughs> Amen. 
Thank you, and you may be seated. And at this time, it's Penny March time. So you still got some kids. Uh, turn to your hymnal to 32, number 32. little choirs when we're all here uh, that a church could expect to have, and we're thankful for that. We're glad for each one that's with us in this morning. Now it's time for the and the opportunity for the adults to match the enthusiasm of the kids with our giving. Okay? And we're going to have the men to come at this time, if you would, please. And I just want to encourage you to uh, practice stewardship in your life. God will bless you for it. You'll never outgive God, and uh, he will rebuke the devourers if we... Just serve him with our giving. And uh, may the Lord bless you this morning as you give. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We're so blessed to know you as personal Savior. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you might bless this offering today, whether it's used here in the local work, whether it goes out in missions, wherever it's used, Lord, just magnify it and glorify it. Thankful, Father, for good services, uh, or the good giving last Sunday and the good services. And then, Father, we just pray that you'll continue to bless into this day and throughout the activities of the day. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen.
Stand together if you're able. 382. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, ladies, for your excellent musicianship. Glad that, uh, as I said earlier, we're glad that we are blessed with such talent as this. And we, you know, we don't, we shouldn't take that lightly because there are a lot of churches today that struggle with, you know, having right having people playing the piano and playing the organ or keyboard or whatever it is and having enough people to who can who are willing and can sing to be able to sing and we are a blessed even though we're a small church we are indeed a blessed church we're glad that uh, he has seen fit to bless us in that way Why don't you take your Bibles this morning or your reading device, whatever it is that you might be using. I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 3 this morning for our text. And this morning I want us to journey back about 2,000 plus years to the early church. We're going to talk about what's been happening in the life of the disciples here in the early church. Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. If you'll 
follow along with me. To whom also he showed himself alive after his suffering, his passion by many infallible or undeniable proofs. Being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But he shall receive power when or after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come, so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, son, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zlates, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord, or all in agreement, in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. We're so glad this morning to have visitors with us. We're glad to have uh, the Bates family with us this morning. Daniel and uh, Jackie Bates. Daniel, Daniel is the uh, associate pastor at First Baptist Church up in Winnemac, Indiana. And we're glad to have them. And Brother Daniel, would you just lead us in a word of prayer this morning? Our Father, we're grateful to be in your house this morning. Father, we do pray for your blessings upon this service. Lord, we pray that you would cause conviction where conviction is needed. Lord, comfort where comfort is needed this morning. Father, we pray that you'll bless this pastor, Lord, uh, Lord, here at the church. Lord, as he is away, we pray that you'll give him safety as he travels back. Father, we ask now for your blessings upon uh, Lord Brother Morris as he preaches to us this morning. Father, we pray that your word will not return void as, it, as you promised. And Lord, help someone today, Lord, that they, if they're lost, that they may come to you before it's eternally too late. Thank you for what you're going to do. We're expecting great things from you as we try to attempt good things for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Pray for your ministry up there and a good fine folks at First Baptist in Winnemac. We spent nine or ten years of our life in that church several years back. And uh, I... Uh, told a story this morning about uh, driving a bus, and that was one of the one of other church, one of many churches that I drove a bus for when I was uh, when I was a kid picking up or when I was a younger man picking up kids. Pray for the pastor, Brother Mike, and his family, and others who are gone this morning, if safety traveling and so forth. Are you back to 2,000 plus years now in your mind, thinking about what it was like in the early church, and you'll. You'll know that the past month in the early church here had been a whirlwind of the Lord's, uh, for the Lord's disciples. Just 40 days earlier, they had seen Jesus die on the cross. And, uh, and on that day, all their dreams and hopes, it seemed, had come crashing to the ground. They hid themselves away in fear of maybe suffering themselves of the same fate that Jesus had experienced. But three days after Jesus died, what happens? He appears to them again alive. The Lord had risen from the dead and now there was hope and still yet they wavered. They were up and they were down. Who does that resemble? Probably every one of us at some point or another in our own personal walk with the Lord. 
Then the Lord took them aside, it says in our scripture this morning, and began to teach them some truths that they desperately needed to know. Verse number 3 tells us, he is going to go away, he tells them. He is leaving his work, his ministry, in their hands. And they needed to know what the Lord expected of them. And so he teaches them. They needed to know that they, what they were going to be doing. So the Lord teaches them. And they needed to be comforted. They had troubled hearts at this time. So he gave him that comfort. He spent 40 days with his disciples, with his men, instructing them, comforting them, and spending time with them. And then after spending this 40 days with them, the disciples are standing with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, it says here in the Scripture. And he gives them some final words of instruction. While they are watching him, while he is giving instruction, he begins to rise up, ascending into the heavens. And suddenly he's gone. He is taken from their presence. And they are left in a sense of bewilderment there on the side of the mountain, I think. In that moment, the disciples were probably filled with a lot more questions than they were answers. Their minds are doubtless filled with many confusing thoughts. And while they stand there looking up into the sky, angels, we know them to be later, messengers of God, appear to them and say, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The angels ask him, What are you looking at? What, what has got your attention? What are you focused on, men? What are you looking at? And that's the thought I want us to think about this morning as we look at these passages of Scripture here in Acts chapter 1. I want to I share with you some thoughts this morning on this question. What are we looking at? I want to point out some issues that I think occupied the minds of the disciples on that day and I think probably occupy the minds of a lot of the children of God even today. Let's explore those things together. But first of all, I think when we look at this scene here on on the Mount of Olivet, I think we see here that Jesus' departure was a very compelling thing. They had not seen this before. I mean, it isn't every day you see somebody lift up into heaven. I mean, that's one of the magic tricks all the magicians want to add to their arsenal of magic tricks is to be able to demonstrate that they have this magical gift to be able to levitate. But this isn't magic, folks. This is Jesus, so the power of God at work here. He's suddenly taken up into heaven. And they didn't know what gravity was, but they knew something held them to the earth. But gravity suddenly loses its power over Jesus, and he begins to ascend up into the sky until he disappears into a cloud, the Scripture tells us. Now, the word cloud that is translated here as cloud is not your typical rain cloud. It refers to a, a glory cloud that surrounds the very presence of God. In other words, when he, it came time for Jesus to leave this world, his Father receives him up into his own glory and took him home. After Jesus ascends into heaven, Scriptures say his disciples looked steadfastly toward heaven. Verse number 10 and verse number, seven, uh, verse number 11, it says they were gazing up into heaven. Interestingly enough, the same word that is translated looking steadfastly and gazing are the very same words. They're just translated a little differently uh, according to the context. It means that they, they had fastened their eyes upon Jesus. They, had, they were looking intently. They were amazed at what was taking place. As I said, this has never happened before. They'd never seen anything like this before. I mean, they'd seen a lot of miracles that Jesus had done, but they'd never seen something like this. And the sad thing about it this morning, in a sense, is that they really shouldn't have been amazed. They shouldn't have been, because you know why? He had told them this was going to happen. John chapter 6, verse 62, John chapter 16, verse 28, John chapter 17, verse number 11. This transfixed looking and this gazing of the disciples into heaven, I think, spoke of more than just them standing in a sense of rapt amazement or rapt attention. It suggests that they were looking after uh, him like men who were worried that they had lost something that they would never see again. They had lost something forever. I think it may even suggest a look of hopelessness 
of bewilderment, of sadness, of brokenheartedness, astonishment. Any one of a number of adjectives, I think that we could address this with. with. Perhaps that is why the angels, I think they even issued, the angels issued a mild rebuke there in, chat, in verse number 11. For the disciples, the ascension of the Lord back into heaven changed everything. This was a game changer. For the last three years, these men have spent nearly every moment with Jesus. They had left their family, they had left their friends, they had left and their businesses to follow him, and now he is gone. And there is a sense here that they just don't know exactly what they're going to do. I'm certain that the Lord's departure left the disciples confused and concerned, and they may not have completely understood why they, he had to leave them and return to his father. But we know, in hindsight, we can look back 2,000 years to that time, and we have the scriptures that can tell us why he had to leave his followers. If Jesus had not gone away, the Spirit of God could not have come. John 16, 7, these men had been walking by sight, folks. They lived with Jesus. They heard his voice. They saw his miracles. They had felt his touch. He was real. He was tangible, and he was there. That was the important thing. They had, he, had, he had always been present. When Jesus died on the cross, however, the disciples were filled with fear. According to John chapter 20 and verse 19, even after the resurrection, some of them nearly quit on the Lord, according to John 21, 3. They saw the miracles, and they saw these things. They were accustomed to him being with him, them, and they didn't think that they could function without his physical presence. That's the challenge we have today, isn't it? We live in the reality that Jesus is not with us in the physical, but we live with the reality that he is still present with us, isn't he? But that's a challenge. Because just like these disciples, we like to see things. We like to have it. We like to touch. We like to uh, you know, see things in front of us that's plain to see. When Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes and will come. And these men will learn to walk by faith, but not just by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The Spirit of God will be in them to empower them to serve. Jesus wanted to use his, his disciples to accomplish great things. He would accomplish that through the help of the Holy Spirit in their lives, John 14, 12. And he promises them he would send the comforter. We enjoy that same blessing today, folks. Because Jesus went away, the Spirit came, didn't he? He dwells within every child of God to lead them, guide them, help them, comfort them, instruct them in the ways of God. Read that whole chapter of John chapter 16. Jesus went to heaven to make intercession for them. When he ascended back into heaven, Jesus sat on the right hand of the Father, according to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3. Now folks, I can't understand this. I don't understand how all this works, and I can't explain how all this works, but the Bible teaches us that when Jesus ascended into heaven, that he is there today as our representative, guaranteeing that where he is, you and I will one day be. John 14, 1 through 3. We have a representative, folks, on the inside. Isn't that great? We have a representative on the inside. Our Savior is in the presence of God where he ever lives, what does it say, to make intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. That is when sin creeps into our lives and Satan accuses us before God and that's what he does. We have a Savior that says what? I paid for that. I paid for that. 1 John 2 1, I paid for that. Every time Satan accuses the brethren before the God, Jesus says, I took care of that. I took care of that. Isn't that a joyful thing to think about? Isn't that a blessing? This is also why I believe that his presence in heaven is why the saints of God are eternally secure. I may bump you. The Savior is ever interceding with the Father. That's what he's doing. Thus we are able to stand both now 
and later, blameless in the Father's sight, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, Jude 1, 24 says. Jesus went to heaven so that he could return for his people someday. Before he went to the cross, he promised that he would return for his people, John 14, 3. The angels at the ascension here reaffirmed that very truth, reaffirmed that very promise. Acts 1, 9, and 10, the scripture closes with his promises uh, and then repeated again in Revelation 22, verse 20, a verse that says, Surely I come quickly. But you know, all we as believers have ever known is that Jesus is not here physically. But I want to remind us that while he is not here with us physically, he is physically present in heaven, interceding on our behalf. One day he will return for his people, and he's going to take them into heaven. That's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 17, and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. And one element that obviously would have occupied the minds of the disciples that day was the ascension of Jesus in the, into the glory of heaven, into the presence of his Father. We would do well this morning to meditate on that very fact. The reason he ascended into heaven is to make intercession eternally on our behalf. So his ascension was a compelling thing, something they had never seen. A miracle like no other miracle that had ever been ex experienced in their, in their lifetimes. But in spite of that, verses number 6 and 7 tells us that their future is really confusing to them. When Jesus, with him going away, the disciples are concerned about what the future is going to hold for both them and for the work of the Lord. They ask Jesus about the future and about when they can expect him to establish the kingdom of God. They want to know if the time has come or if they have to wait. And we see that in verse number 6. And we see their confusion here. And the answer that the Lord gives them might seem as if it's not clear. But what Jesus says to them is essentially this. And he's saying it to you and I too this morning. That it's none of your business. The secret things and the providential workings of the Lord belong to the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29, all the way back here in the Old Testament. We remember that passage of Scripture that says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. The future is a secret thing which man is often prevented from knowing. No so-called psychic or medium or soothsayer or prophet or TV evangelist <laughs> can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh, they may try. You know, there are some who supposedly have some kind of a gift that you don't have, and they can tell you what's going to happen and every day of your life, I guess. But he has prepared our way. He has ordered our steps. And and, you know, listen to me this morning, and, and I'm not so much speaking to this group here, but if you're listening to us out online this morning, you're not in a church, but if you are in a church this morning where you are being led by people who know more than what the Scripture teaches, you need to, get, you need to hike up your galluses and get out of there. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. I don't even know what galluses are, but my dad, <laughs> my dad used to say it all the time. <laughs> But you know, that, that, that's a comforting thought. Our world is filled with pain, it's filled with sorrow, it's filled with heartache, and none of us knows what tomorrow is going to hold. Uh, will it be better? Or will it be worse than today? We, we, we always want to know, oh, I, I wish I knew what was going to happen tomorrow. You know what? It might scare the socks off of you to know what my, tomorrow might hold. Sometimes God keeps those things secret, so just to save our hearts. While the future may be shrouded in mystery, however, as far as we are concerned, we have the Lord's assurance that he's already there. He's already there. He's in our future, and he has our future in hand. The disciples were concerned about the future, but they didn't have any need to be. The, the future was well in hand by, uh, by the Lord himself. So how about us this morning? Do we worry about these kinds of things? 
Do we worry about when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen and if this is going to happen and if that's going to happen? Just give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Our Father has already taken care of all of our tomorrows, folks. They're all in His hands. And we are in His hands. So this ascension of Jesus was a very compelling miracle. Uh, even though that was the case, they had a very confusing future. But add to that this morning a challenging task that they had. We see that in verses 4 and 5 and verse number 8. Another element that had the attention of the disciples that day was this assignment that they were given in verse number 8. What does it say here? In verse number 8 he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus tells them that they were to be his witnesses to the world. They were to begin at Jerusalem, then they were going to take that message to Judea, then they were going to take it to Samaria, then they were going to take it to the uttermost parts of the earth. And they were tasked with sharing the gospel with all people in all places. Their mandate was to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 10, uh, 16, 15. They were to go and teach all nations, Matthew 28, verse number 19. These men have a message to tell. And the Lord had sent them out to tell it. The assignment must have been front and center in their minds as they watched Jesus depart here from the world, disappear into this glory cloud. The last three years, the disciples had watched Jesus do what he uh, was and sending them out to do. They had heard him preach the gospel. They had watched him love the lost. They had seen him cross all social and religious barriers to reach sinners. He had used them to do the same thing. He had sent them out to preach, but he was always there when they, when they went out, and he was always there when they came back. He was always there. Now he was going away. They are left behind to carry on without him. Surely the task that faced them filled them with some sense of fear. How would they do this without him? How would they accomplish God's work if he was not here to help them? In this text, Jesus reminds them that even though he is going away, what does he say? He's not going to leave them to do the task alone. He's not going to leave them to do the task alone. In verse number 5, Jesus promises them that they will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That promise was fulfilled. Ten days later on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came in power and filled the church with power and presence. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. The night before he died, Jesus promised his bed that he would send them someone to help them. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it receiveth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, and he dwelleth with you, and shall be with you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14, 16, 17, and 18. Verse number 8. Jesus tells the disciples that the Holy Ghost will empower them to carry out the mission that God is leaving them here to do. They will not have to do God's work alone. They are promised His power. They are promised His touch. They are promised His blessings as they carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Fast forward 2,000 years. We are still here. God has not changed His mind do we know why we are still here? Now, I know a lot of times we, say, we see some Christians, we say, you know, God should have just knocked them in the head and took them to glory after he saved them. <laughs> Maybe that's what he should have done to me, I'm not sure. Well, one reason he leaves us here in this world with all of his sin and all of its problems and all of its pain is so that we might be witnesses to his saving grace to a world that is trapped in sin. He leaves us here so that the world might see Jesus in you so that you might tell the lost about Jesus Christ and how he can save souls. It says here, you are 
our epistles in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. You are our epistles, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with him, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. He says, we are epistles. We are God's love letters of grace and mercy and love. To a lost world. When they read our lives, they should read God's love. They should see God's mercy. They should see God's grace and His saving power. Listen to me this morning. There is no business for Christian Karens. You know what I'm talking about. There's, I wish they didn't use that term because I have a lot of friends who are named Karen, and they're not anywhere near what the world describes as a Karen nowadays. You know, I, I, wish, I wish it was some other name. I don't know what it would be, but some other name anyway. But you know what? Sometimes we spoil our opportunity to be a witness by our attitudes, by the things that we say. We get mad at this, we get mad at that, and we give everybody a piece of our mind, and they go to hell. Because we shouldn't have been doing that. We should have been witnessing to them about Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship. I don't know how this pertains to this, but it's an interesting word, workmanship. It means the same word as our English word, which we get poem from, a, a poem. It refers to an artist's masterwork, I guess. In short, we are examples to the world that what God can do when he saves a soul. And so our demeanor and our attitude and our relationship with those around us ought to be one that reflects the love and the mercy of our God. That's why we should live for him, why we should always be ready to share the gospel with a lost world. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15. Well, it was a very compelling ascension. They have a very confusing thought life at this particular time. They've been given a challenging task, but thanks be unto God, they give him, he has given them a comforting promise. Again, the, the minds of the disciples are undoubtedly filled with many thoughts. They've been given an assignment that far exceeds their abilities. They face a future that is unknown, probably a little more frightening to them than what they would like. To top of the law, they've watched as their Savior, their Lord, the one who left everything, be, they had left everything behind to follow, disappear into this cloud of glory. They are terrified. And they are so captivated by the sight of Jesus going up into heaven that they are almost oblivious to these two strangers in white who appear on the mountain here with them. The angels tell them, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Yes, he has gone away, they say. But there is no use staring into heaven. With a sense of confused bewilderment, Jesus has gone away. Praise God, but he's coming again. So the implication is very clear. They are to be about the Father's business, knowing that as they work for him and serve him, that he is coming a day when he, when he, there's coming a day when he's going to return. And I know I've referenced this, but that is the same assurance that we have today. While the future unfolds around us with all of its uncertainties, all the questions, why our lives are occupied with serving him, we have the blessed confidence that Jesus is coming again. I love that. I love that. I'm looking forward to that. I'm afraid a lot of, a lot of Christians today are just looking up into heaven. Just looking into heaven. No matter what to, today holds or what tomorrow brings our way, Rest in knowledge that Jesus is coming again. So what are we looking at today? That's the conclusion we draw. What has our attention? What are we occupied with? 
Are we caught up in the wonder of a risen Savior who loves us? Amen. Carry on. But we need to share that Savior. We need to let others know that Jesus loves them and he died for them. Are we actively serving the Lord? Doing the things of sharing the gospel he has called us to do. We are serving the Lord and sharing him with the lost. As I say, just keep on doing it. One day he's coming. He's going to reward us for faithful service. I hope we're looking for his coming. May the Lord bless you this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. What a blessing it is to know you as personal Savior. And I would ask, Father, this morning that our sights and our eyes might be not so just much just fixated on heaven, but Lord, looking out around about us and seeing what is going on and the need of the gospel witness in our world. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your watch care over us. Pray, Father, you'll bless the rest of the activities today. Bless the ones who are gone this morning on, the, on spring break and to give them safety as they travel. There's one here this morning that doesn't know his personal Savior. I pray, Father, that you'll touch their heart. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. I believe we're going to find out this morning who's had some birthdays and who's had uh, some anniversaries.